Susie Ferris, casting director for Jury Duty. Uh, is it safe to say you have never cast a show like this before? Correct. <laughs> so how how was this pitch to you? Um, Dave Bernad, one of the producers, pitched it to me as it's a it's a half an hour comedy, which is your sweet spot, which it is. And he said it's basically the office meets the Joe Schmo show, which I think are two great shows to sort of marry to represent what this is. Um, so he pitched it, he pitched it accurately. And I said, Great, let's um, you know, we'd love to talk to you guys about it. Do you want to send me the script? And then, you know, I'll read it and we'll go from there, which is normal protocol. And he said, why don't we just set up a call? There is no script. So that was, that was the beginning of a crazy ride. <laughs> I mean, there, there are scripts of the descriptions and directions, just no dialogue. No. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no scripts. No, <laughs> no, no, um, no character um, descriptions. There was, there was nothing like that when I came on. It was literally, we are, we are looking to cast a jury of very real seeming people and you know we'll kind of go from there and what they ended up with they ended up with scripts that ultimately that that I didn't ever see because then they became oh, interesting they okay. became beat sheets and stuff like that once once we arranged all of our 12 jurors and then and then you know they figured out what their character names were and who they were and all of that but that sort of came during the process and after I was even finished casting. So they literally did not even write down like story beats when they talked to you. No, they had some ideas of, they definitely, you know, the writers had ideas of what they were thinking or what they wanted to do. But when I first came on, it was literally like, you know, let's just, let's just see some people and then we'll go from there. So when I put out a breakdown, it was, it was just male 18 plus juror, female 18 plus, And I got huge masses of submissions. Mm -hmm. Did you um, specify, you know, uh, like improbability just because, because that's so important in, in this show, yeah. especially. It's so important. Um, I think, yeah, I did. I, we basically put out, you know, 18 plus male and 18 plus female and, you know, able to serve on a jury and, and I think we said comedy, improv experience, a plus. And then that was sort of like, that was sort of the weeding out process. And of course, all the people who, you know, have come across my desk in the past, however many years I've been casting comedies. So, you know, it was a bit of, it was a bit of pulling from the improv world, the people who I didn't know. And then a lot of people seen who haven't been able to have the opportunity to be series regulars, just a lot of people who I've cast in co-stars in various episodic shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine, you know, like one of the joys of casting is discovering new people and giving, you know, someone like their big break, hopefully. And like for this show specifically, it, you, you didn't want to cast like big names or like recognizable people. So Ronald wouldn't recognize them. So Correct. Yeah. So what was it like going through all those? I, were, were they self-tapes or did you meet them in person? No, because of COVID, everything, you know, we cast this right in the middle of COVID or this, this might have been one of sort of one of the few first shows that, you know, that I was working on during the pandemic. So it was a mandate that everything was self-tape. But I have to say in this type of hybrid show, the way that the way that we cast you know, if, if we were ever to do anything like this ever again, I would have to say that self-tape would be the only way because we gave actors two prompts that they could choose from. You know, you could play character A or B and start talking for a minute and, you know, in that character's voice, which wouldn't really work if we were kind of in person together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So as you were watching those tapes, like what, did you know what you were looking for watching them or, or was it just something watching a tape and the, the actor did something and it's like, oh, like this person would be good. I'll keep them right, right down. Yeah. This list. Um, I knew, I knew that I was looking for unrecognizable faces. I knew that I was looking for funny and inventive actors who could, who could remain grounded at the same time. So you know, in terms of specific, you know, specific types of 
you know, I wasn't, I wasn't casting somebody who could play a movie star or, you know, or a waiter or, you know, a blue collar worker or whatever. I didn't have any particular mandates. It just, they all had to be unrecognizable, funny people. And then we were casting all shapes and sizes and colors and what felt like a, you know, a credible jury in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the casting for the show is so crucial. So how much of that was on your mind while you were going through it? It's like this, this kind of really hinges on the, the people you cast here. Well, you know, that's, that's a really interesting question because I didn't really have a sense of what this show would look like at all. I mean, I think, I think looking back now, if you tried to, if you tried to explain it exactly to someone beat for beat, you'd say there's no way that that would ever work. Right. Yeah. So it's just, it's such a crazy concept. So I knew that we were, you know, I knew that there was going to be a fake trial and a fake jury, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know how crucial the casting was when we were doing it. It's just, you know, when I'm trying to cast any show, I want to get the casting right, because if you get it wrong, then, you know, you don't have your audience really, you know, leaning in and and believing it or taking that ride with you so it was sort of I approached it definitely the way that I you know cast most things the biggest difference is that that most of the most of the actors who we were seeing and thinking about choosing were the character was going to be created somewhat around them versus normally an actor stepping into a character that's already written Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating because yeah. there are no character breakdowns. So, uh, uh, were you involved in that part of it all? Like, did you see any, you know, like any peeks into like how they were? Oh, they're gonna make Todd the weirdo, and he's gonna create chance. <laughs> no, you know, I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't part of that process. Once we chose who the actors were, I mean, you could you could kind of see the broad strokes of, you know, Todd, who's David Brown, is a really inventive super funny character actor so you could you could see you could see from his audition that they were going to be able to do funny things with him I didn't the chair pants to me was was the best episode I had no idea that just that was that was genius yeah that that was hysterical and he actually wore them and sat in them so (laughs) oh my gosh you know the one thing like um Susan Berger who plays the older woman who keeps falling asleep Barbara when we get to when we get to that point in casting they sort of had an idea that maybe they wanted um an old female sort of like rock and roller type who came to Los Angeles and was like a rock and roller and so that's that's sort of the talent pool that we started seeing that didn't end up that backstory didn't end up sort of playing out as big as I thought it would but that's where that pool of actors came from and in the beginning, it was really just a blank canvas. And sort of as we got like 75% in, it was like, what if we what if we start seeing this kind of person and then this kind of person, which, you know, obviously is super helpful with casting. The more specific you can be mm-hmm. is helpful. Yeah, definitely. Well, you guys, you also had uh, Kirk Fox. And I know there was some concern about whether Ronald would recognize him from Parks and Rec. And then you guys found out that he was a huge Parks and Rec fan. So the, you, everyone made a decision for him to grow a beard and hang out more in the background. So uh, how much of that was the, what kind of conversation was that like in the casting process with Kirk? Um, well, as I said, the, you know, the first mandate is that people were unrecognizable. So I would say that Kirk was like the biggest, the biggest gamble. But, you know, when you talk about it, when you take people out of, when you take people out of the elements, sort of, in which you know them, I think, I think that that helps. So, you know, given that, given that Ronald truly thought that he was on a jury, I think if you change, if you change a person's appearance and, you know, he might, he might sort of look at him and say that guy kind of looks familiar, but clearly we all agreed that we thought if we made some, you know, physical changes and stuff, um, that, that he would fly under the radar. And, you know, maybe if Ronald thinks about it too much now, he might realize, oh, you know, I'm not crazy to think that that's a guy from a TV show, but Ronald truly thinks that he's doing jury duty. And so we, 
we, from what I hear, we got away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he probably also thinks like there's already a celebrity on this jury, James Marsden. (laughs) What are the chances there are two? (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, I think, I think living in Los Angeles, you know, everywhere you go, even if you go to this, to the supermarket, you might see somebody who looks kind of familiar to you. And chances are you might've seen them on TV before. So that's, you know, that's not crazy you know, wild where we live. So I think that's also some, a consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, well, for James's part, uh, was it always going to be him as the celebrity juror or were there any discussions about someone else? No, um, just like any other role. So this, so that was one particular role where, where we definitely wanted to cast or they wanted to cast a celebrity. So I was sort of approaching that as I normally would and had my laundry list of celebrities who I think, you know, would fit the mold and who I think would, would, could hang in this whole kind of show and then who would also enjoy it. And so we started off with a crazy laundry list of people. And as we started narrowing it down, we all just kept, you know, just thinking about the advantages and disadvantages to people. And there weren't really any disadvantages with James. So we, we went for it and it was nice that he had a personal relationship with a couple of people, um, with Dave Renad, with Jake, who we had all done something called Tour de Pharmacy together years ago. So it was nice to have that personal connection because I think so much of so much of getting people to do this show was explaining exactly what it was. And it helped that Dave was able to sort of back channel and speak to James, you know, before he officially spoke to everybody and kind of say, this is what we're aiming to do. Yeah. There's already that trust and experience there. Yeah. There had, there had to be a lot of trust on this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, there's, um, a uh, Mechie Leaper. He, he plays about Noah, but he's also a writer on the show. So what, what came first? Uh, he was definitely a writer on the show first and, then we asked him to tape just like everyone else. He really just had to throw his hat in the ring for the process. And then we did have a round of really crazy fun callbacks that that uh, that were staged in a very particular way. So he he really rose above in the callbacks as did um, David Brown and Ron Song. Those were definitely three guys after our round of callbacks that we said, okay, they definitely have to be on the jury. <laughs> And and Ron Song, he he had a completely different career before. He was uh, was he a teacher, right? Or I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. I know that he was doing something wildly different, but um, just not not acting. Uh, not acting, but he's also he's had an agent for a while. So you know, just like a lot of people, probably you know, before they before they make it and can quit their day job. Yeah, I imagine he was, you know, living parallel lives for a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you also have uh, several lawyers turn actors, um, both the the defense attorney um, and uh, Jacqueline's attorney were former lawyers, and the judge was Alan Barinholtz. He was attorney, so it was like casting them because you you need yeah. someone who could speak the the legalese to make it believable. You do for this one. I have to say, I was. I was so shocked when I was so shocked to learn how many, how many actors are former lawyers. I never, I never would have suspected, um, you know, when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the prosecutor, Trisha LaFont was an actress that I knew from New York when I lived there 20 years ago. And I never knew that she had a law background and a really impressive one at that. Uh, Alan Barinholtz was, he was practicing law still in Chicago, which was really amazing when he sent in a tape and it was just, it was magical. He was, he was amazing. So I've actually managed to cast him in two projects post jury duty. Nice. He's now, he's now moved to Los Angeles to pursue his second career in acting. And I think he's going to have a big career. Yeah. I've seen him call himself a, a Nepo dad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> His boys are so proud of him. It's great. Yeah, they should be. Mm-hmm. I, but do you think that maybe uh, a lot of lawyers uh, become actors or change careers? Uh, because like part of their job is also performance when they're speaking from a jury. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it depends what kind of um I think it depends what kind of law they're practicing. Obviously, a trial lawyer has a lot of 
you know, similarities. And so it, it seems like a natural transition if they don't want to stay in law. And then the other part is, you know, so many people are not practicing law anymore. And not that, um, yeah, not, not that turning to acting is a safe career by any stretch. <laughs> Uh, not at all <laughs> yeah um well so how involved were you in in the casting for ronald because i know they just kind of put out a, a craigslist thing for the fake documentary right yeah so so i've learned i mean that actually i didn't i didn't handle ronald at all my my job as any other you know any other show that i work on is specifically casting all of the actors and ronald um they did an extensive search for someone through reality channels and and those interviews were quite different i imagine just like casting any other reality show but they had to um yeah they had to um they had to pull from they had to pull from a lot of different pools than i would normally pull from mm -hmm. i mean i always tell everyone is like they you guys like hit the jackpot with ronald because he it it like you know the casting that you did obviously was important but like it it really took it to the next level with him and like his reactions and everything just he's, worked in it really did he's he was so genuine and he was he was incredible the first time i ever saw him was when i watched the show so that was that was really exciting they got we got really lucky mm -hmm. you never know right yeah for sure uh well i watched the the cast commentary and it like it sounds like there were hours and hours of footage that did not make the cut because uh they would spend like eight hours in court just to make everything believable so was there um a, a part uh, uh that was cut or someone with little screen time on the show that you wish was in the show more um you know i don't really know what was cut given that um given that it was COVID, i didn't spend any time on set you know, normally I would, I don't ever have to be on set once my job is done, but I would normally go and just spend some time and see the fruits of my labor. But so anyway, given that it was COVID, it was just safer not to go for everybody. Um, I have to say promote Kumar. Uh, I don't know the name of his character on this show, but he's an oh, old um, uh, Robbie. Right. Yes. Yeah, Robbie. I, I just, I adore him. I mean, it would have been, it would have been fun to see him speak a little bit more perhaps because he's he's just such a character but i think i really think that the sum of the parts i really wasn't missing anything when i saw it come together i was really proud mm -hmm. i mean he does have that moment when he sings the song on the bus that's true he does he <laughs> does yeah i think i think everybody got their moment which i think was was so magical and i also think it was all really believable yeah, to no. an extent. Um, well, since you didn't have any character breakdowns when you started, uh, who who was your favorite character in the end? Oh, my favorite character. Oh, that's that's so hard to say. I mean, I love I love them all. I love the relationship between um, I love the relationship between Edie, Modica, and Mekki. Mm -hmm. And I, I love them all. I also really love Ronald's relationship with David Brown and when he shows him, you know, Todd, when he shows him a bug's life. And I just, I like them all. I don't know. I like them all. And I love, I love Alan Barinholtz, you know, the judge. I love, I love how he relates to the, you know, to the jury and, and especially at the end, how he, you know, how he does the reveal. He's in his Chicago accent. It's just brilliant. So I can't, I can't just find just one. They're, they're all your babies. Yeah. Alan was, is he just really did seem like one of those classic, like curmudgeonly judges, like we've he all did. seen in, in TV and in real life too. So yeah, he really did. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you all, I'm glad that you and, you know, the audience believed it all or, <laughs> you know, and that Ronald found it credible enough to continue. Yeah. Uh, well, lastly, what was your your full, like reaction when you watched the series and fall? You you alluded to it before, like you know you you didn't see the the fruits of your labor until it aired, basically. So and you you get to see it all to come come together, not knowing yeah. what you were casting in the beginning. Yeah. Um. I was I was really blown away. I was I was just blown away by all the characters that they had given the jurors because they didn't have characters when I cast them. So all of that was sort of fleshed out after I was finished. So I um, 
I loved it. I loved it. And then the thing that the thing that's the most amazing to me is how it's caught on like wildfire. All of my little cousins and all the youngsters who I know are all telling me how much they love it. And it's really unlike anything else that I've ever worked on before. Yeah, it's great. No, I tell everyone to watch it. And I, I think it's it's a show that everyone can watch. That's why. I think so too. I've heard families watching it. The 13 year old loves it. You know, I've had the grandparents loving it. People are getting together in, you know, in groups and, and, you know, watching it like they used to do for like sex in the city parties and stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's really crazy to be a part of something like this that has just taken off on social media. It's, it's quite a ride. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'm like, I want another season. I'm like, how would they do another season now that, you know, everyone knows the trick? (laughs) I know how, yeah. How, how would we get away with that? That's kind of, uh, I guess it can't be in a jury. It it definitely cannot be in a jury. Right. No, I will tell you, I will be very excited to get jury duty next time though. It, It will sort of like change my attitude towards jury duty. Yeah. This should make you exempt from jury duty. I feel like. Shouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, Well, Susie, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time and congratulations again. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me.